So, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, welcome to the 88th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, and um, we are <coughs> delighted to have with us uh, two speakers this month. Uh, Mark and Josh, who will introduce, or Josh and Mark, who will introduce themselves uh, shortly. In the normal way, uh, we don't typically do introductions. Um, however, we would like you to let us know who you are and your affiliation and where you are in the chat. And Laurie is uh, putting some prompts in there uh, to uh, uh, allow you to do that. And uh, I'd just like to show you where that information goes because some of you have commented recently that you don't know. So this is our wiki, wiki.ssbmg.com. And, and uh, Laurie is putting the links in there to this month's meeting. Every meeting has a page, so you can always go back. And each of these pages is linked to uh, the, the LinkedIn post for it. Uh, so here's the one for this month's meeting, and down at the bottom here, you can see we've started to add who's here. Uh, for those people in the room, if you could give your information to Tim, other than the speakers who are already on the list, that would be great. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to just highlight on the week that's changed this month is uh, we finally have a page to kind of introduce and summarize uh, the formali formally recognized initiatives of our members. Uh, of which until recently we had um, six and we're adding, sorry, yes, six, and we're adding more, including our presenters this month, as well as some others, and I'll talk about those a little bit more uh, in a moment. So uh, I'm gonna do my normal um, quick introduction. I think I can see that we've got some uh, new people uh, joining us who have not been to a meeting before, so welcome. And uh, I uh, look forward to you uh, putting your information in the chat and, and uh, learning who you are uh, in due course. So as I mentioned, this is our 88 monthly meeting, so I'm gonna skip through this presentation very fast. There is a copy of this uh, in the Google Drive, which has all our presentations and uh, for the last uh, three or four years, recordings of all of our presentations in it, and uh, Laurie can put the link into the chat for that, which is drive.ssbmg.com. So I'm gonna go through a few of these slides um, in, in a little bit of detail. Most of them I'm gonna just jump over because they're all online. And here we have Andrew Simpson uh, joining us. So um, we like to start with a, an acknowledgement of our social privilege of being in this place. Obviously we're a global planetary wide community. Um, and so the normal land acknowledgement that we would do here in Canada uh, based on the recommend one of the recommendations of our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, commission uh, with, our, uh, with the First Peoples, uh, who were here in Canada before us settlers, uh, we've ge generalized this into something that's perhaps thought-provoking for everybody everywhere. Uh, so wherever you are, this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land, the nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. We're privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the settler generations to come and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect people's indigenous to your place, including perhaps yourselves. Today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to peoples from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So uh, that's a social uh, acknowledgement. We also like to recognize where we are biophysically. So uh, we are actually, uh, once again, in this building that you see in the photograph here today. This is the Ontario College of Art Design University's main building, and we're uh, basically at the far end of the red brick area of the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, diagram, and then in that visual picture, and you've got the CN Tower in the background. So um, what I would like to ask you is, do you know what watershed you're in? Answers in the chat, please. Anybody in the room know which watershed we're in? <coughs> Okay, so um, we are in uh, this, us here are in a, uh, in a watershed called Russell Creek, um, and we settlers uh, buried it uh, because we polluted it so badly to become a sewer in the mid 1870s. I've been looking for the indigenous names for it for a long time, and so far I've not managed to find them, so if anybody can uh, uh, tell me what that, that, that is, I would be very pleased to add it here. Um, and just why do we do this? It's because we are intimately connected to our place, and so this session, in a very real way, is dependent on the place. And just as one very, very basic idea, if you visit the bathroom just before, just after, during uh, this session, then you have actually used the ecosystem service provided by this watershed uh, as, uh, in, as part of the ability to deal with our human waste. 
Um, and if you're using the Flourishing Business Canvas, and I know many of the people uh, on the call are first explorers, uh, then this is why we have on the Flourishing Business Canvas partners in stocks and solar power ecosystem services in, in order that we can connect our business models to uh, the biophysical. So uh, as of uh, this month, we're just over 750 people. We've added about 50 people in the last month. Uh, and we are experts, uh, expert practitioners, researchers, and students from around the world. Uh, we continue to believe that we're the first or the only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro economic perspective. Uh, we're using anticipatory system design, systemic design approaches, and we have a strong normative purpose to enable flourishing. Uh, if you look at the wiki uh, under the home section, there's a page there with translations of flourishing into other languages as well as um, other synonyms that we have for flourishing like strong sustainability. So hopefully you'll feel right at home. This is where, where you're part of this, this tribe. So I um, won't go through the group's goals in any detail other than to note again on the wiki uh, there is a page that describes the five streams of, of interest, the five streams of practice and research uh, all around strongly sustainable business models but as you'll see when you look at them it's a very very broad set of, of streams. Um, I also wanted to highlight, as I did last month, uh, that this year is the UN, UN 75th anniversary of its founding, and the UN Secretary General has asked everybody on the planet to reflect this year, and uh, they are actually conducting a planetary-wide public consultation, the largest ever, with all 7.5 billion of us. And um, basically, the Secretary General is asking us to tell the United Nations what is the future that we want. Um, and uh, so if you go to un75.online, you can find a survey to respond to that. We hope you do. We hope you say flourishing is what you want. Uh, and uh, we hope that the UN is listening. And we, in fact, know from some contacts we've had recently with uh, one UN agency and some folks in the UN headquarters that indeed this is a topic that is underway. Um, so I won't talk any more about this. If you want an example of what I did when I filled in that survey, you can look at that. Um, most of you know we're evolving this group uh, to become an institute plus a community up to this point. Everybody's been doing practice and research, uh, funding it however best they can. Uh, we're hoping by moving to an institute plus a community we'll have new ways of uh, funding. So about, again, founding forum held August 2019. We've had some meetings recently. If you want to get involved more, uh, you can reach out to the animators. Uh, and next to the animators, uh, in the room here we have Tom, Tim Posolt. Uh, who's uh, splitting his time between Toronto and Stuttgart. Uh, and in Calgary online, we have Laurie Fairley. Give a quick wave, Laurie, uh, who are shy at the moment and don't want to share their pictures with us, so, uh, but you can see who they are. Um, we are part of uh, what we believe is a growing movement for flourishing enterprises worldwide. Um, and these organizations whose logos are appearing on here are either organizations that are already connected to us or we are connected to them, um, or they're organizations that we see are behaving in ways that are very much aligned with our thinking on strong sustainability and flourishing. Um, since last month, I uh, finally have got around to adding uh, this logo here on the, on the left, which is the Smart Organizational Design Global Network. Uh, this is the global network of people doing socio-technical systems thinking. Uh, this is the work that was, you could say, was started by uh, Fred Emery and Eric Trist in the 1950s and is some of the earliest systemic design work that's been done on organization and strategy. And in fact, out of the uh, work on who our speakers are talking today uh, by Elliot Jacks, uh, he was also part of the founding of, of that movement back in the, in the 50s. So uh, working to, uh, to try and create a big tent for all of these folks, folks on that. So this means, of course, we're aligned and trying to go beyond the UN SDGs. Uh, we have multiple initiatives of our members. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, um, I it's in the wrong order at the moment. So uh, Future Fit, Flourishing Enterprise Toolkit, R3.0, uh, Lean Flourishing, Aim to Flourish, Refocus have been the initiatives that you've heard about many times before. Over the last months, we've um, been approached by members to add more. Uh, back in November, uh, Petrickerson Much, the founder of Lisbeth, uh, the feminist um, entrepreneurship press, uh, presented to us a fantastic presentation. And um, she's got lots of ways for members to engage. So we thought it was about time we recognized them. We haven't quite got their information on our wiki yet, but that will get done in the next month. Last month, we had Morris Fidelli from uh, Thrive present. Uh, he also has, uh, his project initiative has lots of ways of having members participate and get involved, so we thought we wanted to recognize them. Our presenters this month will be making an offer uh, around that, and we have one more 
uh, that we also need to uh, add to, to the list which uh, around the feminist business model canvas. Uh, C.B. Harkwell presented to us about 18 months ago now, and uh, it was only over Christmas that I finally managed to talk to her about getting her initiative added. So, uh, and I shouldn't say, if anybody else has an initiative that you would like to uh, get recognized, go and take a look at that initiatives page on the wiki, and that'll give you a sense of uh, what that's all about, and you can reach out to uh, animators at sspmg.com to make that happen. Um, just also wanted to highlight that we're always making connections uh, in and around our community. Um, and these are some of the ones that uh, we like to highlight each month. Again, I'm gonna add this month, uh, the Smart Organizational Design Conference, which is gonna be September 8th to 11th in Trondheim, <coughs> Norway. Um, as you can see, there's an overlap there with the R3.0 conference. Um, so uh, I know I'm gonna try and be in two places at once, but uh, maybe we can do double duty and some people will be in Norway and some people will be in uh, uh, Antwerp. But I believe, uh, no, sorry, uh, Rotterdam, I believe the R3.0 conference is going to be. So, um, mentioned this last month, won't go into this anymore. A great new book, uh, about a third of the authors in this book are members of the group, including to be transparent myself. Um, so, uh, if you wanna know the latest thinking on how you do strongly sustainable strategy, this is a great book to look at. Um, this month I wanted to also mention uh, this book. This is actually published in 2016, but I only found out about it in the last weeks. Um, this is the rate, latest relevant context for all of our thinking and initiatives. So this is, uh, and a, a book about Earth system science, uh, used to be perhaps more, more well known as Gaia theory, um, and um, this is all about modern equilibrium thermodynamics. So I'm hoping to get Alex Clyden to uh, present to the group in the next months. Um, for those of you who know the framework for strategic sustainable development, um, I am pretty certain that this is the final of the theoretical underpinnings uh, for the eight system conditions uh, for a uh, strongly sustainable for a flourishing society in a flourishing environment. So, um, won't go through this. Uh, so, our monthly meetings are here to share and hopefully inspire uh, you to do things that are related to strongly sustainable enterprises uh, and to get connected to um, other things that you want to be participating in. So, uh, I won't go through that. I won't go through that. So, on to this month's meeting, finally. Uh, and so this month I am absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Josh Bogg and Mark uh, Karasowski, whose name I am badly mispronouncing, uh, to present to us. So let's switch over to uh, their presentation. While you're doing that, Tim or Anthony, can you just chat me the attendees that are in the room there today? Yes, uh, Tim will do that. I, work quite she, she, I think uh, she, he already did, Laurie. So, uh, yes, yes, we're good to go. So, uh, you have uh, about uh, six, 70 minutes to use however you would like to engage us. So, right. over to you. Uh, do you want to take questions during or after? How would you like to? Uh, after is probably the best. I think the way to think about this is it's a bit of context to give, and then uh, we can have that conversation, conversation in context of, of the model. Fair enough. Um, can everybody hear uh, Josh and Mark okay? We've, uh, the, the microphone in this room is not the best one, so can people hear okay? Sorry? When Josh and Mark were speaking then, Laurie can... Yes. Are you on mute, hear... Laurie? Excellent. I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Josh and Mark, over to you. Great. So um, I thought I would start by just sort of describing a little bit about uh, why I'm here and Mark as well. And my, uh, I, I describe my purpose as, as helping support an emergent shift in consciousness. Um, and for me, that, that's uh, tied up in this movement, the flourishing movement. And so uh, one of the things that uh, both Mark and I work on is Tuzzle, which has a, a powerful lens that we'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, and Mark, give a bit of background on yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm here because Josh made me come. Um, <laughs> and Anthony, Josh and Anthony wrote me into this. No, um, I'm, I'm helping Josh with, uh, with, a, with a puzzle to, to bring CHC into the world and, and make it a construct. I'm uh, the kind of person who really likes to see great things out in the world. Um, really, I love what the uh, Strong Sustainable Business Model Group is doing. And um, that's, that's really key in a nutshell. I just want to interrupt. I am having a little bit of trouble hearing you, so I'm not sure where the microphone is for you to. Okay. Let me see. Maybe we just speak louder. That, that might help, yes. 
Okay, so uh, the, the lens we'd like to talk about today is capability to handle complexity. This is the label we use for this. And what essentially you can think of this as a psychological technology. And it really has to do with, let me change slides here, uh, right sizing work. And so the idea here is that there's people develop through different stages of maturity of their ability to handle different size of objective. And when you go through one of these uh, transitions to the next stage, the way you approach problems and the size of problems you approach changes. And there's profound implications both for the diffusion of innovations uh, and different ways of working, including sustainability, uh, as well as how you create organizations that themselves are flourishing by getting the right people in the right roles. All right, so essentially the underlying um, framework for this, um, there was a bunch of research done starting in the, the 1950s where it was discovered that um, inside of organizations work through these uh, concrete levels. Um, and on the right you see we have these levels of work. And so different work inside of an organization increases in complexity. And then what was discovered in, in a subsequent set of studies was that people also mature through these um, uh, capabilities to handle complexity. And that uh, what the real objective is in order for a person to feel fulfilled from their work is to match a person's capability to handle complexity to the complexity of the work. So on the slide here, we talk about if someone is at four, which is called the integration stage, and we'll get into details on what that means, and you give them work at four, which is, which is the system stage, working on and building systems inside of an organization, that person um, is in a state of flow. Their, their work is rewarding, uh, they really enjoy it, and, and you know, they love to get up in the morning and, and put a good day of work in. If you got someone who's at stage four and you give them stage three work or, or lower, we call that state being bored out. That means that the, the work doesn't feel like it's, it's big enough. It feels boring, mundane, um, person doesn't get engaged and um, oftentimes leaves an organization or is miserable or underperforms. Um, and if you give someone who where the work is too high for their current level of capability, um, they're overwhelmed. They'll, they'll get burnt out. Um, they're not going to enjoy it. They're probably going to end up uh, being fired from the organization or leave themselves. And it's, it's, it's not a pleasant play, place to be, essentially. And um, because of the research that was done, this was all discovered. Um, it is kind of how humans evolve um, as, as they mature. It's the theory of adult development. And many organizations are somewhat organized around this, but some of the studies that were done in the 2000s show there's about a 45% alignment. So, so even though uh, there's some alignment, there's not enough out there, and uh, there's a lot of people that are feeling out of place and, and not flourishing as a result of this. And to give you a... Not to interrupt, I yeah. just read that apparently the sound is still a little bit muffled. Okay. People, so maybe we need to... I don't know if we can write it for the microphone Let or see. Like, Okay. Let's try that. Could carry on. And, uh, we'll, uh, if people can report whether or not you're sure. more audible. So the uh, uh, one of the important parts there is that there's a psychological resistance that develops if you have a job that's too big for where you currently are or too small that that um, hurts flourishing and that there's uh, it's a natural uh, thing that society organizes around. It's just the proxies they use to measure uh, what is really CHC are not very good. And so to give you an example of this, one of the uh, construction com uh, company that we worked with for about 25 years um, uh, had a problem where they were trying to take on larger tasks. So you can think they built everything except for uh, houses. And they're in Western Canada facing the boom from the oil. And they're moving from building a school to designing and building 
you know, 12 schools in the same year or um, design, build, finance, and operate a hospital for 20 years. And the actual underlying uh, complexity of the work had changed and they had to make sure they were getting the right people in those roles. And what we found was if you got somebody at the right level, you, you can plan and be pretty sure that they, they will get the work done on time and on budget. And the projects that they had somebody at too low a level uh, for the job, you can almost guarantee it was going to be over budget and late. And the projects that uh, so somebody had, was doing but was uh, a level of capability higher, they could do a very good job and, and do it under budget and early, but they would get very bored very quickly and, and it wasn't uh, something that was a long-term fit. And so the important thing here is that this is a universal model of, of human capability. It's not the only piece of capability. You still need um, knowledge and skills and you, and you need to look at either character or personality and, and some other factors, but that if you don't get this right, you can guarantee failure. And a lot of the time people get this wrong and that's bad for everyone. And so um, the other point to note there is the universality of this is across domains, whether you're a coder in a, a, a tech company or whether you're um, you know, creating government policy or you know, starting a VC track company, these levels of work are the same across those different domains or functions. And so basically, um, the other interesting part about the levels, even though they're one through eight numbered like that, they, they're also organized in these recursive domains. Um, you can look at it as, as, as three domains that kind of sit inside of each other. And, 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 and at the bottom there, we have the um, value added domain and essentially levels one through three is inside of an organization that work um, is where all the value adding work happens so that's like your frontline work that's your case work and and that's your uh, directors managing processes workflows and and it's really the the workforce levels that's that's really what makes the economy tick um, and the domain in the middle there is the economic unit domain or the innovation domain and it's the role of the economic unit domain to actually create the environment in which um, the work that happens in the value added domain uh, flourishes essentially so so you can think of it as each 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 higher domain creates environment for for the flourishing of the lower domain and and you'll notice that three is kind of like a hinge um, level in the sense that they're kind of the translator between the two domains and and the bulk of the work happens at four and five in in the innovation domain and and in the subsequent slides we're going to go into details of each of the stages so i want to set it up for the domains um, and then above the economic unit domain and so the economic domain unit domain is kind of like your your vps or your presidents of of mid-sized organizations and then your worldwide domain um, or your value systems domain is another name that's called is is your global corporations it's your um, governance and, and everything else and their job is to is to create the the environment and the ecosystem in which innovation can uh, can flourish so then the innovation domain can create um, uh, work that 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 can flourish in the value-added domain and so so the three kind of work together um, in, in order to make magic happen. So um, to go over, I think the, we'd like to describe the stages because the, the implications from this uh, are best understood. We understri understand the, the differences of what these levels really mean. And so the, the first stage is really the, the first stage of adult work. Uh, and some people go through this stage early childhood others uh, when they're uh, becoming an adult by other metrics. Um, and what, you're, what the way somebody at this stage thinks or approaches work is really transaction based. They're looking at shaping the physical world in front of them and executing procedures that they've been given. And so you can think of this as a factory worker in the front line, housekeeping, um, physically manipulating the world in front of them or dealing with one customer at a time doing a particular transaction and it's a sort of trial and error of will this thing that I've learned to do solve this problem no if not will this one work and so this is this is where you get um, 
your the, the bulk of the population back in the 60s was here and this was um, this is the the step the frontline work of a lot of companies but stage two is really the frontline work of the modern information companies and I'll let you describe that one so stage two work is uh, the way it differs is um, at at stage one you basically want to a person who is at stage one for them to be happy is they want to be told how to do the work and who to go talk to if what they're told to do doesn't work and who they typically go talk to would be somebody at stage two and somebody at stage two the way they would love their work to be structured is uh, tell me the goal you would like give me the set of tools or techniques you'd like me to work with and then they like to creatively combine them in order to get at the goal um, so it's really the first stage that information work starts as Josh said and you can think of this as like entry-level lawyer entry-level engineer um, a lot of the, the technical programs the graduates um, from those pro programs are designed to be at entering stage two in, in, into the work uh, place and it's it's really about um, what we call uh, casework so working on a case or a small project or, or working within a single activity, uh, such as like uh, graphics design or, or something of that nature. And so um, the next stage, uh, the way that somebody at three wants to be treated is, is they've moved from an individual case or an individual activity or project they're working on to chaining together multiple activities so that they can get from the current state and find alternative pathways to the objective. And so it's, it's really, the way somebody at three wants to be treated is, not just give me something to do, I want you to give me an objective, a budget, and a year or two to do it. And so they're, they're really good at not just doing an activity for the sake of doing it, but doing it so that it puts them in a position for the next step and managing that whole workflow. And so this is a very strong capability that, um, the other thing that's useful here is to notice the sort of subject object distinction that, that changes with each of these. So if you're at stage one, you're shaping the physical world right in front of you. And when you move to stage two, the, the object is no longer shaping the world, it's shaping the pieces or of information you're adding together and using reflective judgment to figure out, to create either a new procedure to do something or to at least solve this one case or activity in front of you. And at stage three, you're not as interested anymore in a single case, you're interested in um, the entire process itself, finding root cause or alternative pathways and structuring activities and chaining them together. Okay, so now we move uh, into the economic unit domain and we're gonna talk about uh, stage four. We say the output on stage four is an innovation and it's really when you move into stage four that you're much more comfortable working in a unstructured environment, uh, much more capable and able to um, work um, in a self-organizing environment where, where, where there is not too many procedures or, or anything given to you kind of created and invented yourself. It's the, it's the traditionally stage four is the VP level role in a, in a mid-sized organization. And um, you're, you're typically working on, on a single system inside of the organization. So it could be operations, it could be sales, it could be marketing. And, and um, what, what your task there is not to just keep the lights on and have the department run, uh, because that's a lot of what the work is three does, um, but it's also to be looking out into the future and, and seeing what the new requirements are going to be and, and, and how to be able to alter um, the system that, that you have under your um, accountability uh, to be able to make that happen. It's, it's, it's oftentimes, in, if people are familiar with the systems model, it's, it's really system four uh, work in terms of looking at the future and, and planning on how to alter the current state uh, into a future state. Yeah, and so stage five is a big transition. Uh, at stage four, you're, you're looking at transforming a system, figuring out which processes, how they fit together, the space between them. Um, but you're, you're working within uh, an organizational context. And when you move to stage five, you move from being trapped inside a system to being able to be on top of a whole system or an integrated group of systems. And so it's the idea of uh, if I ask somebody at four, 
how do you solve this problem in front of you or what's your work? You know, they'll describe a very intricate system with all the concrete processes and work that's going on in, in that particular area, but they're not able to get out and name that. And so, for example, if you have somebody who's uh, running a company at four, you get this firefighting sense where they're, they're um, operating one system at a time, not doing the integrating work and not looking at the market. And so they may describe something. And if you, when they transition to five, they would be able to say, really, that's a low cost to market strategy. This is the, we're, a, we're a, an X business and we're fitting this niche in the world. And so the, the, the reason this happens is there's a pattern that repeats at these different orders of abstractions that people mature through. And so the first four patterns we went through were you were, you're going, uh, shaping the world for sort of transactional or, or trial and error. Then you do activity or adding together. Then you do a process at three and at four you do a system. So it's the, the bringing together and, and managing the conflict of multiple processes. The organization level at stage five, you, you're actually starting that pattern again, but you're doing it at a higher order of work. And so you're moving from the world of, um, things to the world of ideas. And so if we were to use money as an example, at stage one, you can understand the concept of money. You don't see a coin. Um, you, you can understand money in the abstract in that sense. Um, but when you get to five, you understand um, other economic models or, or uh, objects, sort of like money supply. And, and you can fully understand and drill down into that so it's a useful object. So you can think about somebody at five, what they're doing in a business context is they're shaping the business itself. They're looking out into the world and forecasting what's happening in the environment. And they're saying, we need to move over the next five or 10 years to, to, to uh, meet those changes in the sea. And, and then they integrate all the systems underneath them and provide the guidance for the work at four to make sure that the whole company as one unit gets there. And there's some implications for that, for the diffusion of sustainability, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so um, now we've, we've covered the first two domains. We're moving into the third domain, the worldwide domain. And the first stage there is uh, uh, stage six, and, and we call that uh, a portfolio. Uh, typically at stage six, uh, someone is responsible for a portfolio of business units or, or innovations um, inside of a large company like an S&P 500. This would be the EVP uh, stage um, for a role perspective. And here um, you're, you're able to um, build up on this abstract concept idea. And instead of just uh, working with individual abstract concepts and applying them to the real world and, and having them manifest out, in say the form of a, a, a business, um, you're doing that with, with, with several of them, finding a synergy between them and, and, and combining them creatively, very much similar to how work at two was in terms of being able to creatively combine several elements, except now you're doing it at a higher order of abstraction and, and really being able to manage a, a portfolio of things. Um, uh, it's at this stage, you know, you're able to make breakthroughs and contributions to existing theories, be able to run a portfolio of companies, um, and, and that kind of work. Yeah, it's, it's the idea of moving from forecasting what's happening in the future to actively creating the environment or creating the future, if you will, for um, things to emerge properly, for solutions to problems to emerge. And the, the difference when you move from six to seven is the same as moving from uh, two to three in the sense that it's not just working on one particular problem where you're creating the environment for um, something to emerge. Um, you're actually looking now at strategic pathways forward, either, for example, if you're a four-star general in the U.S. Army or if you're a CEO, you're looking at what's happening in the next 50 years that I've got to make sure I can uh, uh, position or what problems need to be solved. You know, are there ener energy requirements that need to change in the next 50 years? Are there um, particular technologies that don't exist yet uh, or consumer demands or cultural things that need to be worked on or, or worked within? And then providing the guidance on those chaining together of uh, emergent uh, 
environments that the people at six can then go and do individually. And it's about saying, yes, this is on the right pathway or no, it's not. And so it's sort of providing strategic leadership um, to uh, worldwide uh, changes. So at eight, we call that the e ecosystem stage. And, and the reason that is, is because it's essentially applying the same type of systems thinking that, that comes in at four, but doing it on a much grander scale. Instead of looking at inside of an organization, you're looking at it at a full ecosystem, planet-wide. Um, you are able to look at uh, you know, multiple industries, multiple uh, market segments, and, and really start looking out 50 years into the future and, and looking at how, um, what sorts of uh, paradigm shifts um, uh, could, could happen in society that could help um, change and augment things, starting to worry about you know, the, the survival of the, of the human race, the species, and, 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 and those types of uh, thoughts. Um, it's, it's, and, and, and some examples of this uh, in the business world, um, you don't see as many people at eight, um, and when you see them, they often have more of an interest in how their industry dominating business is interfacing with other institutions in society. Uh, or you also get, you get people who are finding synergies um, and uh, feedback loops, et cetera, through multiple industries. And so you, you can think of somebody like Jack Welch um, or somebody like Elon Musk are, are actively playing a role in shaping the ecosystem. Um, and are really playing a very, very long game. So the other thing that is useful context for the conversation we're gonna have is that the, the stage that somebody's at is objectively measurable, and you can also get a, um, a measure of gross trajectory that is strong enough to plan against. And so if you're looking here, at, these are three different individual paths that somebody might be on. And, the first one is somebody who's on a path to stage three. So this graph starts when somebody's 20 years old and shows the probable timing of transitions um, until they're 80 years old. And the, the thing to know here is somebody at stage three is incredibly powerful. Um, and somebody, the graph below shows somebody moving to stage five or the CEO of a medium business by the end of their career, that sort of path. Or somebody who's really going to that ecosystem level at the bottom here you can see that they may all be picked out as high potential people, particularly the people moving to stage five or stage eight, but their lives and the way that they resonate with problems, uh, the way they interface with the world, the type of support they need to fully develop um, so that they can use this capability is completely, completely different. And um, what we're really looking at here is, is the tail of the bell curve on capability and showing very fine but material differences in those capability levels to make sure that it's not just that there's this worldwide domain. It matters if you're at stage six, seven, eight, or, or five even to, to have a full ecosystem of those people working on all those problems at all those levels, or else you're, you're not going to get something that diffuses properly. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, um, is that there, there are these stages of development that people mature through in capability um, that uh, match the different levels of work. And if you have alignment, you've got somebody who themselves has an opportunity to flourish and be engaged at work, um, but also will get be uh, much, much more likely to be successful in their role. And if you have misalignment, you can pretty much guarantee they won't be successful without the aid of luck. And there's many symptoms that people look at. Um, some of them can be mental health, millennial turnover, um, and other areas where really at the heart of this, people were just not set up for success. You know, when Elliot Jacks was doing some of his implementation work, it was uh, incredible some of the almost over the weekend changes that were happening. Now he's looking at a management methodology that may be a bit out of date for today's world, but part of this was getting the work done at the right level. And people who were underperforming and miserable and stressed at home were showing up almost over the weekend and, and it was, they were completely different people with completely different performance. And so 
this is something that should be in your awareness as an important part of flourishing itself. So basically, um, there's, there's several implications and we can go in, in a few directions. Uh, one of the reasons we kind of wanted to set this up as, you know, give you a context, give you some of the implications and, and hope that there's some good questions where we can deep dive into, into these areas. And I'll talk about some of these areas um, of implications. Um, one is the fusion of sustainable business practices. Um, and that has to do with the fact that you got these domains. So when someone is in a value added domain, they're worried about keeping the lights on and making sure the company is running. Um, someone in the, um, in, in the economic unit domain is concerned about making sure that company is uh, surviving and thriving and, and generating, uh, you know, value generating revenue. And they, they really trust, um, on the people in the, um, worldwide domain to be creating the theories that they can plug in and start using uh, uh, the support mechanisms and, and, and all those other organizational principles um, and so that has an impact on when and where sustainable business practices should be designed and how they should be diffused um, there is also um, in the area of working in groups because again depending on what uh, capability level different individuals are at they're going to show up differently um, by being able to understand um, that that uh, where people are at, at in terms of capability and their ability to see problems and talk about problems. It helps uh, with with how you organize groups in terms of uh, management structure instead of self organizing groups and, and things like that. And one of the things to note here is that you can have as benevolent a manager as you want. If you have somebody at stage three managing somebody else at stage three because the person can only see this much of the picture and actively work on it right now, they're looking at a process and the support they really need is somebody to do each activity for them. And if it's not set up as a peer relationship, they naturally will delegate one level below, one work level below. And so somebody else who's also only going to be engaged in trying to think about how do we set up this process or this workflow is being given work of, of trying to make activities work. And, these two people would be um, much more uh, happy and have better output if they were peers and were figuring out how to do the work underneath them. And this is um, something we see very common, especially in big organizations, that they have too many layers of management, particularly in the middle of their company. Um, then we got uh, getting the right size to work. Um, Again, being aware of the fact that uh, people are at different capability levels of different uh, parts in their life. Um, so, so oftentimes uh, proxies are used to guess at a person's capability. Age is a proxy. What school they went to is a proxy. Um, and if that proxy isn't working and you end up someone with a higher capability level and you give them work that is the wrong size, um, they're not going to feel fulfilled. Um, Likewise, um, you know, there's the Peter principle that everybody's aware of. Uh, same thing sort of happens. Um, and um, so there's that aspect. And I would say that the other component to this is if you only do the work of redesigning um, frameworks and models of sustainability, um, as an example, but if you, have a, if you have a company and everyone is at stage six, nothing's going to happen. Um, unless that company happens to only be doing work at stage six, but almost every company needs to drill down and get work done at the value added domain. So it's, it's not that each of these stages of work are important. It's actually that they're, they're required to get this work done. They're, they're necessary. And so it's a matter of, um, being able to look at, uh, re bringing back in hierarchy in a way that isn't about power, isn't about status. It's about um, a recognition of different strengths and um, setting people up for success and engagement and making sure that the work is getting done as, as, a, as an organic, complete whole. And uh, one of the things we've observed is there's um, actually a talent upshift um, and we're getting people who are in the 60s, 40% uh, of the population is at stage one, 40% is at stage two seeing a shift where now that 40% is distributed between two and three. And we're seeing a lot of friction right now intergenerationally where 
we got uh, millennials are getting a bad rap um, in the sense that uh, we got work that's designed for people at say two, one or two and they're coming in at two or three and they're just not engaged with the work. Um, and, and part of that is that they're actually ready for bigger things and the organizations aren't ready to give that to them and, and they're struggling uh, with turnover and, and, and things like that. Yeah, and part of the problem there is it's both that they're ready and they're not because when people are growing at a really high uh, fast growth trajectory, they don't have the grounding experience per se or, or the knowledge. Now, some people, depending on how high your growth trajectory is, you can pick some of that up in near real time, but there's uh, a need for that experience. And when you're looking at the old way of how people think about um, uh, matching somebody to their work, the it's have you done this before? Have you been around long enough? And the truth is, yes, the generation is entitled in the sense that they feel they're ready for something and they, they don't have a lot of the grounding, but also they are ready. They just, it's, it's a question of support uh, and, and figuring out how to mutually respect um, experience and skills as well as, as raw horsepower. And the last implication is in the entrepreneurship space, a big passion of mine. I'm, I'm quite a bit involved in there because um, I'm very interested in this idea of diffusion of innovation. And in, in, in the entrepreneurship space, what you have is you often have individuals who are on a high growth trajectory. So at some point in their life, probably in their 40s or 50s, they'll be able to really run these enterprises effectively, but they're getting into it much earlier in their life partially because they're finding hard fit inside of, of, of regular enterprises and that the whole community in and around entrepreneurship isn't set up to be aware of this and we're creating these environments, uh, these meat grinders essentially, these environments that are burning uh, people out um, as a result of a misunderstanding of the kinds of support and the type of work uh, that entrepreneurs are ready at the different uh, parts of their entrepreneurship journey. And there's other um, implications around education and coaching and, and stuff like that. It's, it's fundamental to how people engage in goal seeking behavior, how people do work, um, and ultimately how people work together to, to solve the world's problems. And so I look at this as a psychological technology that um, allows us as a society to organize and solve problems a lot more effectively than we've been doing it um, and also can do so in a way that, that's better for everyone and so there's there's profound implications in a wide variety or a, a, a large spaces but it's it's fundamental to how people work this is this is something you have to get right or the rest of it's not going to work but it's also a compliment to everything else that's going on. And I will finish with this because I'd really like to get to a, a dialogue. Um, I appreciate the attention of the people who've been able to show up today. And what we're really trying to do, you know, I've seen, I've seen people in positions where they're misaligned or where this is not taken into account. And I've seen the pain of that, uh, both from the people involved and, uh, in all parts of that interaction. And I've seen it when it's aligned and it works really well. And so for me, that, that's why I'm doing this. I want to I, I wanna reduce the suffering where I can. And one of the things that we're looking to do is I, I think what's happening here in the flourishing movement is really important for society. And so we'd like to co-create with this community an initiative um, that, that would be symbiotic in nature. Um, and I think we have some ideas on how that might work. Um, and Mark will describe one of them, but it, it would be good, I think, to do that in a co-creative way. Yeah. So one of the um, one of the spaces we're playing with is or playing in is the entrepreneurship space, and we're looking to uh, design a new kind of of incubator. I, I don't want to use the word incubator um, because it has a certain set of connotations, but I'd like to think of it as a uh, innovation diffusion institute um, that works on a completely different model than, than the current model um, that allows um, people who are interested in entrepreneurship and the diffusion of innovation to to earn essentially a living wage and to work at a pace um, that is much more human and humane 
um, but that and, and provides them the, the necessary support structures that they need uh, more than just uh, here's a seat and a desk and a set of advisors and good luck with that. Um, that could help with accelerating the diffusion of innovation uh, while still, you know, being respectful of the human condition and, and, and the need to, uh, to have a life beyond your venture. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, if, if you're interested in hearing more or having a conversation with us, our email is on the screen here. Uh, but we'd like to turn it over for, for questions in whatever application area or general area would be, would be of service. Thank you very much. That was a, a really useful and uh, comprehensive introduction. Thank you. That's uh, exactly what we needed to, uh, to start the conversation with provoking. Um, so uh, if folks would like to ask questions out loud or if you're feeling shy or would prefer to type, then feel free to put them into the chat. Um, while people think about that, I, I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative and, uh, and ask uh, one of them. And I've been taking notes here uh, of, of, uh, of questions. So, um, so I'm not quite sure where to, I'm trying to think which one of these is the most, most interesting one. So, that I, I, so I couldn't ask you something about entrepreneurship. Uh, on Dean Hogaboom, who is a, a thought leader in the group about flourishing entrepreneurship, I don't think you managed to join this up, but it just joined. Um, so maybe I'll ask one about, uh, maybe I'll come back to that one, but the, the one I'll start with is um, uh, relates to some terminology uh, that, you, that you used earlier on. So um, the, second, um, set of scale, the, set of sca the second scale, uh, you used the, um, exactly, the, um, uh, the value, actually we need to go one slide before we talk back. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the economic unit domain. Um, I'm kind of curious because obviously we in this group have contextualized economic within society and therefore within the environment. Um, and similarly, the word ecosystem here, um, you're using that in a organizational sense rather than its ecological sense. And so I'm kind of curious about that. And I was wondering if you might relate it to some work that uh, our member Panos Panayopoulos has been driving from his PhD, which was what happens to VSM when you contextualize it in this way? Um, so we have got some people in the group who have been doing work to do that kind of thing, to take a model that didn't formally include this idea um, and, and bring it forward. So, so what's, what's your sense about, you know, when you put CHC into this, into this larger context, what happens particularly to those two terms? I think you should take that. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I get to take it. I was here to answer this question. <laughs> okay, um, two-part question. So first, let's talk about the economic unit domain. Uh, actually, I'm going to combine the two. So essentially, um, from, from VSM, the idea is that, at least my interpretation, and Carlos may challenge me on that, right? um, but um, is we're looking for when is the system viable, and I, I think of that as when can a system exists inside of a hostile environment. So, so that's, it's viable in the sense that it's not protected in any way and it can adapt. And based on the, the levels, a system has to be led at five essentially in order to be viable. Um, and and so, so, so it's, it's leadership at five and that's in the economic unit domain and, and that's really important to think about because like, for example, in Canada, about 80% of all organizations in Canada are at four or five, um, essentially. Uh, we don't get too many at six or seven. Um, and that when you have an organization at five, they're concerned with, with themselves as an organization. And if they are going to take up an initiative such as sustainability or something, they, they need it pre-digested for them. So they need it in a book, in a concise format, in something they can deliver and they can absorb and start to uh, diffuse inside of their company. They're not going to be doing the thinking themselves, right? And so basically, they're going to want to... Um, uh, if, if they're left to their own devices, they're gonna go with whatever they learned in business schools or whatever others are doing. And if that isn't what we need right now on the planet, um, then we have a problem. So we, 
what, what really has to happen is the people working in the worldwide domain need to be creating uh, frameworks and theories and helping them, uh, helping people at five be able to take those and run with them inside of the organization. Um, and the, the other thing just to say with that is there's a, when you're at five, you're really doing trial and error of abstract concepts. So you're saying uh, you're able to step outside of an organization that you're working on and, and shape it, but you're doing one thing at a time. Let's try this abstract concept on it. Is it working over a long period of time as opposed to at six? And this is why um, it's really doing the, the work of creating the environment. You're able to pull, pull up and hold in your head at the same time, multiple abstract concepts and say, where's the same? Where is it different? Where's the synergy? And let's create a new thing to go test. And so if you're asking somebody at five who's a very capable president of a company to do the work of figuring out what sustainable ability means in their context, um, it, it has to be pre-digested to the point where it's, it's go try this, not, um, you know, let's look at sustainability and look at my business model. They can't do both. They, but they can take the context and operate within it. Yeah, and that's why five is the hinge layer between the two domains, basically. They're kind of like the, uh, the ambassador um, for, for, the, for the worldwide domain stage. And then ecosystem, the ecosystem question is um, important because of the fact that I actually wasn't using it just in the economic domain. I was actually using it in the broader sense. So, so at eight, you're actually thinking Yep. really about ecosystems, whether it's uh, the ecosystem, which is our planet, mm -hmm. or some other system of systems, yep. uh, a good way to think about an ecosystem, or some other systems of systems um, uh, that could be in another sense. So, so what happens is when you're at eight, you're no, you're no longer just, just, you can't help yourself but to be broken out of the profitability paradigm, basically. Yeah. Um, so, so, so at seven, you can still be really absorbed with profitability and, and, and have externalities. Once you get to eight, you can't help yourself but, but be aware of those externalities. And, and you can't just sacrifice things to profit anymore. And, and you're sort of aware of these huge paradigm shifts that take maybe a thousand years or a couple hundred years to happen. And that's what you're trying to think of. How do I transform the whole system that our society is built on to match the emerging needs? But you're not necessarily manufacturing what's coming. Yeah, and, and, and I guess just to tie your VSN question is, um, is that really organizations led at five and that, that's really leading uh, system five. System four work has to be led at four and the design of the other systems, systems three, two, and one, has to be led at four as well, but the operate, operating of that of those systems happens really in the value added domain, and it's uh, work at three, two, and one, depending on the complexity of the work, um, and that's kind of how it ties together. So, Panos is asking a, a, a question based on one of the things that you just said in, in your comments. Yeah. Does this mean we sh shouldn't hope that business leaders will lead the flourishing effort? Uh, they will just be implementers. Can level five do design of their own flourishing business model? I don't know I, if they, I can. Can you hear me? And if it's yeah, like too loud, the background noise that you might just stop talking. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's 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 both interesting and a bit discouraging. You know, I mean, we're trying to do like uh, business modeling sessions, co-design sessions, you know, with business leaders, and and that, for example, can have a huge impl implication on who we bring into the room, right? So it seems that you're saying that using the business model for anyone under like the system five level doesn't make any sense. Even if they do understand a bit like how the environment like can impact their business, yeah. they, they will always prioritize profit making, which is, which is understandable. So yeah, so, it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> so it's about tools, okay? So it's about tools. So, so what we do as humans is we invent tools and tools augment our capability. So um, if, if Josh and I have a job and I get a hammer and Josh doesn't get a hammer and we have to uh, you know, nail in nails, I, my ability to nail in nails has been augmented as a result of that tool, right? So the business, flourishing business model canvas, which is, which is what I'm really excited about, is actually 
a tool that allows someone to augment their capabilities. So if someone is at five, naturally they may not think about those things, right? But now you bring this tool to them with, with a book, with an explanation, and now as they're making their business decisions and thinking about those things, where they would have been naturally inclined to think in a narrower scope, they're able to um, look at the broader scope. Um, and and the, the way I would say is, someone at five would use the Flourishing Business Canvas differently than someone at six, okay? Someone at five is kind of using it, where I would, I would encourage them to use it as, is, is kind of like as a, a document that documents their work as they're exploring in the space of the business model. So it's, it's so sort of like an artifact from the trials from, from as they're exploring the organization and the shift. Whereas at six, they can start to use it also as a modeling and a projection tool, so to speak. So the same tool, you can use it differently and it increases your capability. And, and I would also, sorry, I would just, I would add two things to that. One is um, calculus is an example of a tool like that. It wasn't created down at the value adding domain, but it can now be used then. Uh, and so it's about that type of diffusion. And the second thing I would say is there's, there's um, actually a difference between, so we're not just looking at where you are today. The growth trajectory that you're on actually makes more of a difference than where you are today, which is a, 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 something we're discovering that's a very, has its own implications. Um, and by that we mean, Somebody who's at five but probably won't make another transition um, will, will not be able to use this the, the full extent of what you're doing compared to somebody who might be at four on, on the path to mode six or seven um, or, the, or somebody at five who's on a, a growth trajectory. And the good news is, as a society, I think we have um, this talent upshift looks to me to be enough that it's about supporting the right people, that they're there, there are enough. And it's uh, many of the people who would be in a position of leading an organization, um, that's not the full capability that they'll get to. And they may be able to resonate with this more. Um, but if you're looking at, if, so the, way I, the other thing I would say about that, if you're looking at the whole economic domain, it's not going to be your mom and pop shops that are taking this up. It's not gonna be your sort of small-ish, medium businesses, um, and it will be some of your level five businesses, but a lot of your the, the work is really being led at six and seven, and, and that, that might be a better avenue. Uh, I have a question. And we also have a question from Andine. Go ahead, Laurie. Um, well, so we're talking about um, complexity and uh, like attached to that, I guess, is uncertainty. Now, I'm curious because, um, the, the the complexity and uncertainty that individuals in society experiences is really partially, if not fully, part of the layers of conflicting operating systems that we have. So the sort of pathway that you've uh, created with these circles and these, these one to eight, it seems like a straight path, but I'm assuming that people aren't a one or a four or a five. They're, they're, they're people aren't, they're, they're the uh, composite. So how how do you do, how do you talk about that? Well, it's it it is really more like when somebody goes through a transition, their whole being changes. How they interface with the world changes. Their approach to problems change. Now, that's not to say that some of level one work is doing the dishes. Everyone does the dishes, but it almost becomes unconscious or something you wouldn't want to sit down and and be gripped by and work on. And it's the center of gravity of the person at, at, when they've made a transition is, for example, at four, the thing they're gripped on is um, the, these trends that are changing in, in the particular business they're in and the system that they're working on and how that um, is pulling together all the processes that are going on. So they're really, um, they, they may have parts of them, for example, that growth trajectory bit where if that same person who's at four now is on path to seven, they may resonate with those ideas and really be, be exploring abstract concepts, even though they can't work with them consciously yet. But the majority of their time and energy and fulfillment comes from working at the stage they're at. And so what's the process of moving people through 
through that or, ha or, or the people move through your, your um, dem demo here is because, ha so I'm assuming that in each of these levels, habits are formed and that, that helps screen out the complexity for when they're in that level. Um, and so the in internal and external uh, factors that are going to help them move to the next level, how, how are we supporting people to achieve that or how are people getting that for themselves? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, if we just leave people alone, these, these do happen naturally. Um, sort of at their own pace and to some extent they happen when people are ready and that's a pretty predictable timeline um, but with that said there are there are some factors that are particularly uh, useful if, if somebody's interested in speeding up um, or supporting their development now the the note I'll say before we get into those factors is um, when, when you debrief somebody so most scales and uh, you know I don't like using numbers all the time and, and that type of stuff because it's like the wrong way to look at this is I'm three out of eight. It's, um, it's what that three means out of the whole system. And when, when you can talk to somebody about here's how you like to work and how you resonate, and here's what it would look like to move to the next domain or the next level or next domain beyond what you're probably already on a path to. Most of the time people are feel that they've been seen, that their capability has been seen and that they don't have a desire to move beyond what they were naturally moving to. Now, with that said, in the case that somebody would like to, um, I, I think the best way to think about this is metacognition, taking a step back and looking at how you approach problems. So when I was going through a, a transition or before I was supposed to go through the transition from three to four, I um, remember writing out this great big model of how I saw business. And... Um, my grandfather at the time looked at me and he works with us and he said, well, have you ever thought about how all these processes relate with each other? And I had never thought about it. No, I couldn't do it. It took me two years to learn to do it, but it was continual guidance of here is what the next stage looks like. Here is how I'm currently thinking about it. What would it look like if these things were to move between each other? And so, you know, I don't know what the upper limits are to developing beyond your current trajectory are, is, or if there is any, um, but it certainly seems to me that this, the speeding up of it is taking the time to, to step back from the work and, and reflect on how you're approaching it in general. And it's useful to find people who can ask those probing questions because if you are, are showing something that you're actively working on with somebody who is naturally at the next step above you, their natural reaction is to ask questions or, or make comments from that stage above. And that's sort of modeling what the next stage looks like. And then, um, so if you imagine somebody who's in stage three, what I, um, who might move to four, I would get, make sure that either a manager or a mentor or a coach at four and that they carve out time to work on how they are thinking. And then, mm -hmm. As they progress, I'd say, okay, so as opposed to you running one process right now, let's do two at the same time and see how that feels. Or let's move you from, because one of the things you want with that particular transition is um, general systems theory is something useful to learn because it sort of is a crutch to, like it, it helps model that next stage. Um, and becoming multilingual, so you're not just somebody who works on these type of processes in this, this domain. You need to start learning multiple languages so you can see, um, know what HR thinks of or marketing thinks of or um, operations thinks of uh, their processes so you can now see where the conflicts are coming in. I think one of the things that I've um, uh, started to realize about the power of, of uh, this way of thinking about the relationship between work and people's capabilities is the fact that it gives us a way of in a very systematic way, finding mentors and coaches. That's right, yeah. Um, and um, I, I'm gonna to bridge to Aldine's uh, question about how does this relate to startups? Um, because one of the challenges that the research in the startup area shows, which has been almost completely ignored by public policy, is the fact that most young people don't have the experience to be able to be successful entrepreneurs unless they happen to already be quite high. Well, my, yeah. Our guess is that they need to be quite high up in the maturity, in, in, the, yes. in the levels. Um, so with that in mind, and also because you also mentioned the, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the incubator accelerator idea, um, 
maybe you'd like to comment on, on some yes. of these aspects from a, an entrepreneurial startup perspective. We could spend a whole day talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> so don't get me started. Um, <laughs> but I will, I'll leave I will, you open the can of words. Uh, yes, you have, but uh, this is... So I'm going to go to this slide because the two bottom ones, um, the stage five growth trajectory and stage eight growth trajectory, both those individuals actually um, probably feel like they want to run their own show, do their own thing at some point. Um, and so, so does a stage six and a stage seven the growth trajectory person. If I had the slides here, I'll show you. But one of the big problems is that a, a big problem right now is all of these incubators inside of universities. Uh, they drive me up the wall. Um, and the reason is, is because look at the stage five, the one in the middle is when they graduate, they're mid stage two, maybe high stage two, okay? They're not really ready from a complexity perspective to be um, running a, a, a sizable business. I mean, uh, they could, but they're not really ready for it. And in fact, for that individual, it might make a lot of sense to go into industry, spend 10 years there, learn a bunch of things, and start to consider this um, you know, when they're slowly entering into stage four. Um, but even the individual at stage eight growth trajectory, which is a very, very high growth trajectory, even them, they're still at stage four. We're saying stage five is really when you can make it work. And what I mean by make it work is the, the problem today in the startup space is venture capital. Uh, venture capital is, is a huge plague right now. And the reason is, is because it doesn't work like investing, it works much more like a bond market because the, the general partners that, that pull the capital from the pension funds have to give it back in seven to 10 years. So the moment you as an entrepreneur accept the venture capital, it's like lighting a fuse that's seven to 10 years long on a bond that's gonna blow up. And you are on a tight timeline. And what we're saying, and based on the studies that were done in Sweden, is if you're not already at stage five at that point, with the little support that you get in the community, you're probably just gonna burn yourself out and not give the people the money back. Um, and so being aware of this, um, we're, we're actually working with, with an angel group right now, and, and we're trying to show them that Sure, you can invest in, in an entrepreneur who's at stage three or at stage four, but if you do that, um, you may want to look at longer time windows for getting your money out or creating an effective support structure for them in the form of a board or coaching that's going to help them transition through those stages or help them as they transition through those stages and help them make certain decisions that they're just not ready for yet per se. Um, and so, so I, I feel like this actually has a huge impact on entrepreneurship and, and, and not just entrepreneurship, but I think um, diffusion of innovation um, it because, because I feel like entrepreneurship is one, one aspect of that, of this diffusion of innovation. Um, and I think that there's this term that they call entrepreneur uh, where, where existing organizations are also trying to diffuse innovation or innovate. Um, and oftentimes they will actually not pick the right people or, or build the wrong teams um, because of the fact that the, the profile the individual you need to innovate is not necessarily the profile of the individual you need to be able to effectively work inside of a large corporation. Um, and so I think this has, has a deep impact. And, and what I would add is what's, one of the things that seems to be happening right now, and it's partly a consequence is if you were to properly structure a uh, sort of entrepreneurial environment, you would want, uh, there has to be stage six work at least that is getting done. And that stage six work is helping integrate or interpret and uh, the environment so that the, the right businesses from the portfolio can emerge and that there's synergy between the parts of the portfolio. But that work really takes at least 10 years, maybe 20. Uh, to organically happen and so when when they're on about a half that time window we find that um, many of the people in the investing space are at one level too low um, where they're operating at five themselves and that most of the entrepreneurs that we're seeing are at four and the reason that is is when you're at four you're at a very high capability and if you're at four at sort of the age that most people think you should be starting a company you're on a very high growth trajectory. 
And what happens from that is most companies overlook you and you're not going to get a chance to do stage four work anywhere unless you find some very peculiar place or get lucky. And so you try to start your own thing and you can do the work of creating uh, like the, the product market fit of, of innovation, but you can't do the work of pulling that together into an organization or doing the right innovation given what's going on in the market. And what, what you can do to sort of counteract that because people are often here have enough growth trajectory that they will resonate with that type of work, but just can't work on it themselves consciously. If you create a board um, that is at five or six or some, depending on the situation, to do some of the integration work and you get a team of fours together, you get an emergent level five output, which is what's needed in this situation. Yeah, I just had an example, I just did a debrief uh, this morning of, of uh, two, two co-founders. Um, they're both on a stage seven growth trajectory. They're both at four, one is a little older, so he's, he's close to the four or five transition. And, um, you know, the advice I gave to them was, that's great if you guys work together as a team and you can get yourself a chairman that's at five, that's able to bet your ideas and help prove things out. Um, you're gonna be able to move through this effectively. Um, and so, so it's, it's, it's about setting the support structure uh, for the entrepreneur and, and that's one of the really big things. It's it's both support from above and from below because The other thing that the the entrepreneurs can now use this is to understand that as they grow because Usually what happens with the startup is you got your four or five people who are typically high growth trajectory people and they all work great together They get a bunch of money and they now start hiring and the people they're hiring in are not the same uh growth trajectory anymore and are demanding certain things in terms of systems and structure. Um, and, and there's this shock in, in the organization saying, whoa, uh, we, we got to fire these people and get ones that can work like us. But, but the numbers work against you because uh, probabilistically you're going to uh, pull from the uh, lower growth trajectory. So, so there's also a bunch of guidance that can be given to the entrepreneur in terms of how they can scale up their company as much as what guidance they need in order to create a viable company. But is that, is that something, is that, do those kind of shocks also exist? So in the strongly sustainable business model flourishing business canvas example, we're looking at the financial uh, systems, the natural systems, uh, environmental systems, and the societal and cultural systems. So you could have multiple shocks going on at the same time because of the different systems that we're considering. Is that something that you're thinking about? That Laurie's just asked the same question I did. That, that is correct, and exactly that. And oftentimes the shocks come from uh, the wrong capability individuals in, in the wrong system. Uh, we see that a lot in governance, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go against democracy, but because we have elected officials, sometimes you get elected officials that come in and are not at the right capability level for the job for what the job requires um and so there you see a cascade failure in essence so so what happens inside of private industry at least fortunately is if if i uh, g is a great example so g under jack welsh was probably a stage eight company the person who came uh, after him um was probably at stage seven Fast forward 20 years and you see that GE had to break up. They had to spin off GE Capital and GE Industrial is a shell of what it was under Jack Welch. So you see that the, uh, uh, the leader or whoever's in that position uh, will bring the company up or down, right? So the same thing happens in governance. So, so you get an uh, elected individual and they come in and they're not at the right capability level, they may get the wrong civil servants and there could be this whole cascade um, shock to the system um, as a result. Um, and, and because institutions such as, such as governments work on a much more slower uh, time scale than companies because uh, companies can fail and, and, and fizzle out, um, but uh, governments don't. And so you can see these shocks reverberate for, for years or decades as a result of these things happening. And I suppose if we if we use the canvas or the tools that we're talking about around creating uh, flourishing businesses, then we could be having whatever the opposite of a shock, a positive shock to having businesses that develop and flourish. 
Exactly. You have a positive reinforcement. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's that's yeah. the beauty of it. You have a positive reinforcement tool, a tool, and and it's a really powerful tool because it helps people think bigger, right? So so we talked about growth trajectory. So if I have someone on a stage seven growth trajectory, they're at stage four right now. I put the canvas in front of them. They have the ability to um, see because of the growth trajectory that all these boxes need to be filled and it may pull them out of the system for work they're doing and then allow them to think a, a little bigger. So, 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 so it's, it's a very powerful tool and, and I'm really excited. Um, um, that I it know, I was, we, we just have a couple of minutes left. I'd like you to, to comment on what you've just heard since you asked the question. Sorry, you're talking to me. Yes. Oh gosh. Sorry. It's that time of the night where I have multitasking uh, stuff going on. Um, I think it's so interesting and I mean, I think the the comments that you've made are certainly things that we seeing in startup programming, startup incubators, in startup teams. I'd really love to talk about this more. It's great to have some backup uh, information and some real validated work around the hunches we've been gathering uh, for some time. So. I really, really be keen to connect. It, it makes so much sense. It's really nice to see so, it like that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering again. We've, we've observed before in the group that we often end up contextualizing our work in the first iteration of that contextualizing, you know, bringing it down from four, uh, uh, six to five. I think it was the level you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, between startups and established businesses. Um, and I, I think this might be another example of that. So, when, for example, when we were building methods for use of the canvas, we've got one method, lead flourishing startups for startups, and we've got flourishing for strategy design methods for existing businesses. Um, the Future Fit Business Benchmark is another example, almost entirely focused on existing businesses, although we've been trying to apply it in the startup space. Um, and we've got a number of our other projects are, are, are bifurcated in this way. So I was one, I'm thinking that as you think about um, you know, what could the initiative of this group be around this topic, that um, maybe pick one of those to start with and focus on it. I mean, if you've got enough people interested in doing both at the same time, you've got the capability to lead it, then that would be fantastic. But I, I, I would recommend doing, wherever the energy is in the group, go, go with that yes. one first. Yes. Is, is there a way to map this? So for example, the Strong and Sustainable Business Model group is a essentially a giant collective of up to 2,000 people. How would we map this out and find out where we are, where people are in your in your sort of platform here? Well, the work that's being done is this worldwide context of, on the ecosystem work. And there, it's being done at different levels in my view. Now, my hunch is most of the people who are particularly active uh, in this group would be on a trajectory to six or higher. It's something that you're naturally interested in bringing. And you could be sort of anywhere along um, the, the current capability levels, but you'd be on that type of growth trajectory. And that's where the resonance comes from. Um, and so, you know, I don't know the group well enough to know um, sort of what that distribution looks like. Uh, and it, But it may be one of those things where there's uh, a, a good relationship in terms of doing some of the drill down work um, but resonating with the overall picture. So one thing I can observe, Laurie, is that like, one of the things that, has, um, that all the initiatives have in common, um, and, I, and I think almost all of the initiatives have done this quite consciously, although without this framework in mind, is that they've all, they're all doing things actively to do that contextualization. Because one of the things that you have to do to bring stuff from six to five is the people at five are in a particular context. You know, they're yes. in a particular yes. culture, they're in a yes. particular yes. sector, they're in a particular group, they're facing a particular issue, um, or they're in a particular place. That's and some combination of that creates their context. Um, and you have to bring a generic tool like Future Fit, like the Flourishing Business Canvas, um, like the R3 Transitions Program into that context. And so almost all of the program, all the other initiatives have, um, varying ways of engaging with that degree of variety in order to learn what works. So we're taking people who are, we're trying to find people who are fives on a trajectory to seven, who can who kind of get 
the, the fundamental value of it, but don't quite know how to apply it. So, yeah. but, they're, but they're willing to try it, unlike people who are, you know, maybe at five and not going to go, not going to proceed uh, further. So I, I think, um, I mean, this is one of the other things this is doing for me is really validating a lot of the intuitive thinking that we've done in the group and a lot of the intuitive um, project design decisions that were initially designed. And, and, and this is this is what's important about this is. It's not like Elliot Jacks invented this. It's not like he sat in a in a tower somewhere and said, "This is this this was 50 years, three longitudinal studies, two 20-year ones, one 10-year one, including a 20-year one in, in the U.S. military." And he uncovered this, right? Um, I don't know what happened there. Um, he he uncovered this, and so the world naturally organizes around this and intuitions are there to do it. But by being aware of this, by having this as a descriptive theory, a lens in which you can interpret the world, you can do it more effectively, right? right? Yeah. That's yeah. just like, you know, before we, we had Newton's laws, it's not like we weren't designing things in the physical world. It's just after we had Newton's laws, we were much more effective at it um, because we, yeah. we had a descriptive framework. Uh, that worked. So I think that's a very good uh, conclusion. We're, we're just a few minutes over the, uh, our time, so I, I do want to try and respect that. Um, so I think what I would like to suggest on behalf of everybody is that um, having had this discussion today, um, if anybody would like to reach out to Mark and Josh, please do so proactively. Um, yeah. You can find them through the LinkedIn group. They're both members, uh, and any member can talk to any member on LinkedIn if they're not connected. Um, it's probably the easiest way of doing it. Um, and if you've got some particular ideas of, of where an initiative of members of this group around the CHC idea uh, would add value to you, uh, please let Josh and Mark know. Um, yes. After a, an appropriate period of time, you can decide how long that is. I would suggest you try and write up a, a proposal yep. Yep. Uh, and post that to the wiki page for the CHC initiative that we'll create on the Wikipedia site. And then call, uh, put a post in the LinkedIn group to say, we've got this proposal, We've heard from a few people. Who else is interested? And then have a meeting. You can use our Zoom facility for that, yep. uh, and uh, you know our animators can help organise that. And I'll, I'll certainly be interested in listening into that at, at a minimum, uh, and uh, and to see how uh, how we can move this uh, very exciting uh, idea forward. So thank you both very much. Uh, really pleased that you. Thank you for coming in all the way from from uh, Cambridge Waterloo Kitchener area. Uh, that was uh, much appreciated to have you here in person. That was a treat. And uh, I would just close by letting everybody know that next month uh, we have another uh, fascinating topic looking at this whole space from another uh, view, a very different view, uh, and that is from the biomimicry uh, standpoint. So uh, some of you may know that uh, in Toronto we actually have some uh, leading edge members of the Biome Star, biomimicry, biodesign communities. And so, uh, led by Norma Holmer, with some other folks from California and Montreal, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, we're going to have a, an introduction to biomimicry as far as its application to strongly sustainable business model design, and we'll see where that takes us. So, thank you all very much. Uh, we'll end the recording now, and uh, we'll uh, see you all, and many more, hopefully, next month. Thank you all. Thank you. So Andine's gonna definitely connect. Yeah, well, we're gonna do long things. Thank you guys. That was amazing. Thank you. Hey everyone. <laughs> are you still on? We are still holding. recording. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to stop the recording. So I can't say anything bad. No, don't say anything bad yet. Stop. Wait a few seconds. Okay, tell me when I can go. <laughs> I wouldn't mean bad, I mean naughty, really. Oh, it's over here. Hi, Panos. Hi, Dean. Nice to see you. Hi. <laughs>